I wish you good fortune in the wars to come. And now it begins. If you were not a book reader, Game of Thrones may have gripped you quickly with two things. The opening scene beyond the wall with the White Walkers, and then this. The first you see Ned, he's looking down on his children. Is this a family man? You probably didn't think he was a bad guy, right? Then when we move on to the very next scene where a man who we met in the opening survives an attack by some form of monstrous undead people who will later learn to be the White Walkers. Now he's been captured and Ned along with his men arrive to hold him accountable for leaving the Night's Watch. A lot of this may not make sense had you not read the books, but we as an audience know what this deserter was up against and we can justify his escape. So when Ned beheaded him, did any of you question whether or not Ned was a good guy or a bad guy? As a book reader, you may have wondered this as well. Ned then approaches his youngest son, Bran, and says this. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. It was honor that compelled Ned to execute this man. But this example serves my point throughout this video as I review Ned Stark. Ask yourself, does honor equate to good or right? For better or worse, honor guides everything that Ned does within this time of season one of Game of Thrones. And as we revisit season one and look closer at Lord Eddard Stark, my only request is that you keep that question along the way in the back of your mind. Is the honorable thing always the right thing or the good thing to do? My answer is no, and I'll spend the rest of this video explaining why. This all starts with the death of John Aaron. When Catelyn informs Ned of this unfortunate news and adds that his best friend, King Robert Baratheon, will be traveling to Winterfell, Ned is intuitive enough to assume Robert is coming all this way to have Ned follow him back down south to King's Landing and to serve as Hand of the King. And once Robert arrives, down in the crypts, Robert offers him just that. Not only that, but a royal alignment that would have Ned's daughter marry Robert's son. There's a reluctance from both Ned and Catelyn, but in the show, what really puts Ned over to join Robert in King's Landing and accept becoming the Hand is when Liza sends a writer in the night with the declaration that Jon Arryn was killed by the Lannisters. Now off screen, Ned accepts Robert's invitation to serve as Hand. Now please comment below your thoughts, but I believe the best move would be to refuse Robert or to bring Robert in on the letter that Liza sent. From what we understand from Catelyn, it's just that Liza claims the Lannisters killed Jon Arryn. It's very vague and no details are provided. This is used as seemingly the primary motive for Ned to head south to King's Landing to investigate. I guess my question, wouldn't the best cor course of action be to investigate the claim made by Liza? I understand not bringing it to Robert's attention there in Winterfell with the Lannisters present because it could cause a lot of problems without knowing exactly what happened to Jon Arryn. Going to Liza is never even considered until Catelyn later takes Tyrion captive. The first episode ends when Ned joins Robert to go out on a hunt. A moment later, we see Bran is pushed from the tower by Jaime Lannister. That brings us into episode two. Ned seemingly has no thoughts to share about Bran. At least not on screen anyhow. It seems odd that the Lannisters have been accused of killing the Hand and now they're in Winterfell and Bran suddenly takes a terrible fall when everyone in Winterfell knew Bran to be a sure-footed climber. Ned says his goodbyes to an emotional Catelyn who's upset that Bran has yet awakened from his fall and Ned then just leaves for King's Landing. Robert and Ned catch up a little bit in a scene when the party has made a stop. The conversation is a bit lighthearted at first, but eventually gets a little tense when Robert discusses Ned fathering a bastard. Ned is short with Robert about this until Robert kind of turns the table on him and brings up Daenerys Targaryen and Khal Drogo's marriage. Now I think this is important because it reveals to Ned Robert's temperament, something for him to be mindful of as he goes to King's Landing. Moving along in their journey, the issue at the trident between Arya, Sansa, Joffrey, and Micah, and of course Nymeria, Arya's direwolf. 
I'm sure everyone knows what has happened here. Now, once Arya is found and brought before the king as well as Cersei and Joffrey, there's some back and forth as Robert tries to dismiss the event as just childish arguing and fighting. But what should be a major warning to Ned is how severe Cersei responds to such a petty matter, ultimately demanding that Sansa's direwolf lady be killed since Nymeria cannot be found. Another example of Ned displaying his honor by insisting he do the deed of killing Lady if it must be done. At this point, the Lannisters have been accused of killing Jon Arryn. There's absolutely some suspicion of Bran's fall from the tower, Cersei's command of an innocent animal being killed, and because of the incident with Joffrey, let's not also forget the Hound is commanded to kill Micah, the butcher's boy, over a children's dispute. These things individually are cause for concern, but collectively, they might as well be a declaration of war. Proceeding forward at this point is a blatant risk to himself and his family. But how could Ned turn back now? That would not be the honorable thing to do. And now we're on to episode 3 of season 1. And on subsequent watches, there's a couple things about season 1 as a whole that I wish I appreciated more the first time I watched. But the pacing is so good, so well executed, that you really need to admire what the showrunners did early on with the series. The way they compile numerous chapters from the books into one episode, and yet it never really feels congested or rushed, everything maintains a nice, slow burn type of pace. I just say that to say, regardless of later seasons, you gotta tip your hats to D&D and HBO here. But the episode starts with Ned arriving to King's Landing. A small council meeting had been called upon Ned's arrival. One of my favorite scenes takes place when walking through the throne room. Ned encounters Jamie Lannister awaiting him. And I really hope this video does well so I can justify doing more videos like these because Jamie is such a great character and I'm looking forward to doing a cover video of him in the future. And this encounter brings out so much more than what's within the dialogue. Jamie is really taunting Ned to start this conversation. Eventually, the conversation turns to discussing Ned's father and brother who were killed in this very room. I'm sure many felt Jamie was the villain and justified by Ned's overall tone and attitude. However, after watching through to season three, audiences begin to understand Jamie far better and it makes this scene so much better and layered in the future on rewatches. Now we're from Ned's perspective and Jamie is a Lannister and Ned believes that the Lannisters are behind the murder of Jon Arryn and may be conspiring against Robert. And as far as a battle of wits, I think Ned holds his own here, except one line. You served him well when serving was safe. Now I'm not really sure what Ned means by this, especially since Robert has been king, there was only the Greyjoy Rebellion, which Jamie fought in, and many have praised his performance in that battle. Let me know in the comments what you think maybe I'm missing here if you know, but Ned makes it known he has little respect for Jamie and holds the slain of Aerys Targaryen against him. But Ned is kind of inconsistent here as he will later display respect for Ser Barristan, who fought loyally in the trident for Rhaegar Targaryen. And I'll point out another moment here in just a little bit. Next, Ned moves on to the small council, and other than a smile for Renly Baratheon, Ned clearly is not here to make any friends, as he finds a reason to be short and cold with everyone at the meeting. Varys for not praying for the butcher's boy, taunting Littlefinger for challenging his brother Brandon Stark in a duel years ago. And lastly, taking a subtle jab at Grand Maester Pycelle for serving the Mad King. Again, it's kind of confusing because Jamie was criticized for turning on the Mad King. Sir Barristan is praised for continuing to serve Rhaegar Targaryen. And Pycelle is criticized for being loyal to Aerys. I, it's just inconsistent. If you guys see something that I don't see here, let me know. It's just, it's a little strange thing. I just don't quite understand what they're going for here. Then he ultimately does criticize them all for allowing Robert to put the crown in debt. Just not a very warm introdu introduction to his position. This has nothing to do with honor or loyalty or anything like that being good or right. It's just kind of a disrespectful introduction and not getting him off on the right foot with any of these guys. 
and as things like this, they just never seem to serve him all that well. He says to Jamie once, he doesn't fight in tournaments because when he fights a man for real, he doesn't want him to know what he can do. Unfortunately, he doesn't apply this same line of thinking in the political arena at all. He seemingly wants to telegraph everything he's going to do, at least politically. Next, Ned has a small gift for Sansa that she seems to reject, stating she hasn't played with dolls since she was eight. I think this is small, but it really does show the disconnect from Ned and Sansa, and really Sansa's reluctance to take pride and ownership of her northern roots. In the books, this is made more evident as Sansa basically informs on Ned to Cersei when Ned decides they will leave King's Landing. But that's not made clear in the show, so I think it is a subtle substitute to show a slight dissent with Ned and Sansa, but more of a rebellious teenager-daughter dynamic than anything that seemingly has less consequence. Now, contrast that with the next scene between Ned and Arya, Ned seems to be able to communicate with Arya in a way that he just can't do with Sansa, and it shows a huge difference. Arya embraces her name, her roots, and wants desperately to be more like her father or her brothers Rob and John, rather than like Catelyn or Sansa. Ned connects with this, and their relationship is clearly stronger than that of which we see with any of his other children in the show. Ned ultimately embraces Arya's desire to keep her sword needle, and even hires Serial Pharrell to teach her to sword fight. This scene also contrasts well with an earlier scene in the episode with Cersei and her son Joffrey, where they're discussing politics and enemies and schemes. While there's no denying Cersei loves her son, she also encourages him to feel entitled to anything he wants. And if you listen to their dialogue and their scene, it's just a very different tone, whereas Ned displays his love for Arya with guidance and understanding and patience. Ned is later greeted by Littlefinger. He's informed that Catelyn is in the city. Littlefinger takes Ned to Catelyn. Here Ned attacks Littlefinger because he thinks it to be like a prank of sorts. But this quick temper here shows where some of the prejudice against Northerners is derived. As Littlefinger states, quick temper and slow minds. Ned learns of the story with the dagger and cat's paw and Littlefinger claims he will help Ned stay alive if he can and Catelyn insists Ned should trust him. We as an audience know nothing of Peter Baelish's schemes or anything yet and first time watchers I'm sure felt pause here as did Ned as did I but for Catelyn she has a blind spot for Peter and this begins the real game that Ned is just not equipped to play. But he follows this in their next scene before Catelyn leaves by preaching caution and that they must have proof before any action is taken. This is important when you decide to defend Ned's actions because ultimately it's Catelyn who compromises their plan for caution. So this is good evidence against Ned being strategically incompetent when it comes to navigating the politics of King's Landing and really what's going on around the Seven Kingdoms. The episode closes out with Ned seemingly experiencing some form of PTSD as he watches Arya train with Serio. I'm not sure what this is trying to communicate to the audience, but I think it's Ned realizing that war could very well be on the horizon. Let me know what you guys think about this moment. Uh, you know, If you disagree with me, what are your thoughts? What's going on here with Ned as he watches on with Arya and Serio sword fighting. In episode four, things get interesting with Ned's investigation. But first, there's a scene that shows a greater descent with Sansa toward Ned as she tells Septa Mordain that she'll never forgive her father. Again, showing descent. This continues to build. Meanwhile, Ned is dealing with the small council on some general matters, but then inquires with Pycelle about John Aaron. This is important because that's when Ned gets his hands on the book on the uh, lineages and histories of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms, with descriptions of many high lords and noble ladies and their children. This will be an important book for Ned's investigation. Also, Pycelle informs Ned of John Aaron's last words. The seed is strong. That will become very relevant soon enough. I like this part of Ned, and I think this serves well for those that want to say that Honor did serve Ned well. Strategically, he didn't make a whole lot of mistakes, and he's not, you know, as some would call him, stupid. This is a good area where he kind of disproves that a little bit. 
I don't think this comes across as a fool really at all. There's a sweet moment between Ned and Arya next, but I think that better serves Arya's story and I'll save this scene for that video in the future. But it's worth noting Ned's reaction to Arya is very understanding and I think the more people learn of his sister Lyanna, it would better explain why he seems to have greater affection toward Arya when you compare it to his affection and relationship ultimately with Sansa. Later Ned learns from Littlefinger of all the spies and whispering in King's Landing. He also learns of Sir Hugh, a former squire turned knight just after the death of John Aaron. Littlefinger encourages Ned to have Sir Hugh looked into, while also informing Ned of an armory that John Aaron was visiting and suggesting that Ned needs to look into this as well. Ned tells Littlefinger that perhaps he was wrong to not trust him. Littlefinger tells him that distrusting him was the smartest thing he's done. This moment is significant for a couple reasons. Ned is being pointed toward discovering the truth about Robert's children with Cersei, but more important, and you'll notice this on rewatches especially, in the Game of Thrones, Ned is out of his league. Ned operates with honor above all else, and honor in the Game of Thrones is almost forbidden because it's inflexible. It's a game for schemes and clever tricks executed by magnificent liars. Ned is straightforward and honest and therefore, in my opinion, out of his depth. Ned goes to the armory and this is where he meets Gendry. Gendry tells him that his mother had yellow hair. Ned looks closely and the pieces start coming together. Gendry is Robert Baratheon's son. Robert Baratheon has dark hair. Cersei Lannister has yellow hair. Their children have yellow hair. But Robert's bastard son has dark hair, but his mother had yellow hair. So the seed is strong. Robert Baratheon should be producing dark-haired children. That's what we're supposed to arrive at. That's the conclusion we should be arriving at in this moment, or at least getting pretty close to. Next, we see Ned in the Hands Tower not attending the Hands Tournament. Cersei comes to visit him. She states she'd like to put the mess with the wolves on the King's Road behind them, but then questions why he's even there. She states that he can't help the king, that Robert will do whatever he wants. Then she antagonizes Ned, saying he was trained only to be a good soldier and a follower, that, her, that his brother Brandon was the real leader and should have been the Lord of Winterfell, etc. Or that's implied. He warns her, though, before he makes a move, and there's a glaring example of this a little bit later, but this is a mistake. If you disagree, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the section comment section here. As we go into episode 5, Ned is sharing pleasantries with Sir Barristan while questioning what has transpired with Sir Hugh. Again, I think it's peculiar how Barristan is seen so positively in Ned's eyes. Anyway, Ned goes to see Robert to tell him that fighting in the tournament will not bring him happiness because nobody would dare hurt him. Taking the fun out of it for Robert, it's a nice light-hearted moment with the fetch, the breastplate stretcher line, but ultimately it's just Ned telling Robert he can't fight, or he's not allowed to fight, and if he did, nobody would want to fight him back. The scene following is the joust between Sir Loras and the mountain. Nothing much to do with Ned other than it's a bit of a sneak peek about the mountain's ability to nearly behead his horse. This will come up again later. Next time we see Ned, he's scolding Arya, sort of. In the midst of this, Arya tells him how she heard men discussing his death and the inevitable war between the Lannisters and the Starks, or how she says, the lion and the wolves. We know what it means, but Arya doesn't, and Ned has an idea, but not knowing who had this discussion still keeps him in the dark a little bit. They're ultimately interrupted by Yorn from the Night's Watch. He calls Arya a boy, and be mindful of that for the future scene at the Sept of Baelor. And we can discuss this further in another video about Arya, but this is a really neat uh, between her and Yorn. At least I think it is. Yorn breaks the news to Ned about Catelyn taking Tyrion hostage, and now it begins. The plans to investigate and gather evidence are essentially up in smoke. Peace isn't impossible, but it's highly unlikely. Ned is on his way to see Robert when he's asked to go to a small council meeting that Robert is at. Robert is irate about Daenerys becoming pregnant. But before we can get into this part, Ned was going to Robert to deal with the situation that Catelyn has put him in by kidnapping Tyrion. But instead, Ned must deal with Robert's desire to kill Daenerys. 
If you listen to everyone on the council, they all believe killing Daenerys is the best course of action. Now looking back, I do wonder if Ned has a soft spot for some of the Targaryens, specifically the children of the Mad King, as well as the children of Rhaegar, or if it's strictly his honor that disallows him to disagree or to agree with Daenerys' murder. It's probably a little bit of both here. Also, Ned declares Ser Jorah a traitor and that his word cannot be trusted. Littlefinger quickly mocks this by calling Ser Jorah a slaver, but admitting that it's a small difference to an honorable man. But it's that sentiment as the rest of the council that shows Ned Stark and his honor as impractical, if not a bit foolish, and also almost looked down on by the other lords of Westeros. Or at least mocked. Maybe not looked down on, but definitely and openly mocked by the other lords of Westeros. It's not until now that Ned truly realizes how brutal this game is and what it commands from you if you wish to participate. And what it requires Ned is something Ned is not willing to give. He resigns as hand and begins to plan for his and his family's exit from King's Landing. Lost in this is he's abandoned seeking a solution with the, Cat with the Catalan and Tyrion situation, which proves to have a significant consequence coming up soon. Before they can leave, Peter Baelish comes to see Ned and entices him to stay just a little bit longer until nightfall to see the last person John Aaron saw before his death. Ned ultimately accepts this. He goes to meet a worker in Littlefinger's brothel who claims to have mothered Robert's baby. It's all coming together for Ned. Upon leaving the brothel, he's amb ambushed by Jamie. This happens differently in the books but serves the same purpose. Jory is killed and Ned and Jamie have what is seemingly a very even sword fight, surprising even Jamie. Unfortunately, one of, this, one of Jamie's men intervenes, and I can't wait to discuss the, this differently in a Jamie video soon, but Ned is wounded with a spear through the leg, and Jamie rides off demanding the return of Tyrion, ending the episode. Episode 6 opens with Ned awakening to Robert and Cersei standing over him. I have problems with Ned's logic in this sequence. Now we can argue his mind state at the time, but there's things that Ned does not do and say that causes me pause. The Lannisters seem to be moving against the Starks, almost openly. Ned has been attacked in the street by Jaime. I struggle to understand why the letter from Lysa has been kept a secret. If it's Ned not fully trusting Robert, then why even come to King's Landing in the first place? These are questions I struggle with in the first book as well. And at this time, Catelyn is in the Eyrie, and she too never really discovers how Lysa knows the Lannisters were behind Jon Arryn's death. It's easy in hindsight, but Ned came to King's Landing and has made no friends and seemingly distrusts Robert. So when people criticize his actions, especially in these upcoming scenes, I do understand. I don't always agree, but I get questioning his strategy. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Robert states he's in debt to Tywin, so I get that it's complicated, but if you go back to episode 2 on the King's Road, Robert makes it clear that he's expecting an attack or a war from someone. He doesn't know where it's going to come from, but he can feel it. Ned knows this and not saying anything to Robert about any of his issues and suspicions with the Lannisters isn't honor getting in the way, it's poor strategy from my view. Let me know how you guys see it. But now Ned makes the move that I believe is the nail in the coffin, or at least a couple of them. First he sentences the mountain to death for crimes committed in the Riverlands. This is where Sir Gregor Clegane cutting off the head of his horse after losing the joust to Sir Loris comes back into play, as a knight taller than anyone has ever seen is reported to have ravaged a village and cut off a horse's head. Littlefinger and Ned identify this as the mountain. If you go back and watch, it's easy to say Littlefinger baited Ned all the way, but Ned is supposed to be a reasonable man of honor. Yet each decision he makes here is more drastic than the last. Littlefinger guides him, but there's no way anyone suggested he do this next thing. Grand Maester Pysa, my lord. Send a raven to Casterly Rock. Inform Tywin Lannister that he has been summoned to court to answer for the crimes of his bannermen. He will arrive within the fortnight or be branded an enemy of the crown and a traitor to the realm. This is outrageous and an overreach that in no way would Robert agree with unless he knew his children were bastards, if he knew the truth and if he knew everything that Ned has been keeping from him. 
but even Ned has yet to figure that out just yet. Nevertheless, this is a decision that can't be walked back. Commanding Tywin Lannister of all people to do anything is risky. Commanding him to travel to King's Landing to answer for an alleged crime? That is a declaration of war. And Ned has set himself up to be more vulnerable than ever before. Ned says to Littlefinger when Littlefinger questions his decision about provoking the richest man in the Seven Kingdoms and that gold wins wars. Ned says, then why is Robert King and not Tywin Lannister? That's a fair question, but Robert being King has proven to be no advantage to Ned thus far. So assuming he's got leverage because his friend is King... Seems miscalculated at best. Greatest king that ever was, a golden lion, and I'll give him sons with beautiful blonde hair. The lion's not his sigil, idiot. He's a stag like his father. He is not. He's nothing like that old drunk king. Now this clicks with Ned, and he digs back into the book of uh, House's lineages and uh, history after he informs his daughters that they'll be sent back home to Winterfell. I encourage you to read the books because Sansa does something here that's not in the show, but I believe is significant. While digging through the book of the Great Houses, he discovers that all the Baratheons are black of hair, but Joffrey has a golden head. Combine that with the seed is strong, and he learns what Jon Arryn learned, and potentially what got Jon Arryn killed. Obviously, this turns out to not be what got Jon Arryn killed, but regardless, Ned knows now that Joffrey, Tommen, and Marcella are bastards of incest. So we can have a big debate about how Ned defines honor, because I'm very confused. Is honor also a synonym for loyalty? Because if it is, his next actions are incredibly disloyal and therefore not honorable. So I'm a little confused about how he views honor, how is it defined, how does it work in Ned Stark's thought process? Because the last thing he should do is the very first thing he does in the beginning of episode 7, and that is tell Cersei he knows the truth. He knows the secret. This is where many claim that Honor got Ned killed. You could say that compassion for Cersei's bastard children got him killed, but warning Cersei didn't get him killed. It was Ned not taking Cersei's threats seriously. She essentially threatens Ned that you either win the Game of Thrones or you die. She threatened him before when he tells her he was trained to kill his enemies, and she responds, as was I. Ned is not in a position of leverage here. Cersei isn't moved or scared when Ned reveals he knows the truth. That should be his warning, and you could forgive this if when given the opportunity to reestablish some leverage, he takes it, but he doesn't. At this point, Ned needs to bring Robert entirely up to speed or leave King's Landing, King's Landing as fast as he can. But unfortunately, those options become narrowed quickly when Robert is fatally wounded while hunting. On his deathbed, Robert asks for Ned to serve as king until Joffrey comes of age. He has Ned write it up and Robert signs it. Telling Robert the truth about his children is useless at this point, so he changes the wording of the letter. This really makes no difference as Ned does eventually send word to Stannis that he's the rightful heir. In the book, Stannis already knows this. In the show, it's Ned's letter. Stannis and John Aaron both seem to be investigating Robert's children. They cut this in the show a little bit, so it makes sense that Ned is now how Stannis finds out in season two. Moving on, into the hallway is hinted that Lancel had something to do with Robert being too drunk or poisoned even, but it's of no consequence as it's not investigated further by Ned. He also informs Varys to not send killers that after Daenerys, but Varys says it's too late. Those birds have already flown. It would have been interesting in the later seasons if like Daenerys somehow found out that Ned was willing to step down his hand over Robert's decision to have her killed, but that that's for another discussion for the later seasons and I don't feel like criticizing D&D in this video. As I said before, Ned is running thin on options. He either tells Robert the truth or goes home immediately. Well, Robert is dying and that should make a clear cut for Ned. Go home and dare the Lannisters to mar march north, which they've never done. But then a lifeline. Renly insists that they should take Joffrey captive and impose their power over Cersei. If Ned wants to stay, it's the only option he has. The Lannisters have shown no desire to adhere to Robert's wishes or loyalties, 
and Ned should not expect him to. Pushing Renly away was his last hope if he wished to stay in King's Landing. Again, what's the motive to stay? Robert's dead, and his children are Ill illegitimate bastards, so Sansa isn't marrying the prince anymore. There's no reason to think he'd be safe to stay unless he joined a cause. He says it would dishonor Robert's final moments, but he honors Robert so much he never trusted him with the truth from episode one on. And he warns Cersei because, uh, uh, you know, is that not disloyal to Robert? And is loyalty not attached to honor in Ned Stark's mind at all? If you guys want to clarify for me or what your thoughts are, please comment down below. I know I sounded like I'm a little bit more passionate about this than I really am. I'm just confused about how honor works for Ned Stark. And if we're going to use that as that's the catalyst that got him forward with every strategical decision he made, well, having a flawed outlook on what honor is, what those values are, well, and then not being flexible with that honor, it, it just it sounds like a recipe for disaster, and that's ultimately what it becomes, at least for him. So... Ned writes Stannis his letter and sends his messenger. Littlefinger visits to share a much more viable strategy than Ned has come up, come to up to until this point. But now Ned's going to go ahead and ignore two superior strategies now, and he's going to go with his own. Again, getting played by Littlefinger. Now, I believe had Ned accepted Littlefinger's plan, things would have gone much differently. Ned would rule, and Littlefinger would assume a significant role, if not becoming the hand to Ned himself. At least that's how I interpreted Littlefinger, uh, his pitch to Ned Stark. We just don't really know. This would be a huge opportunity for Littlefinger, and I believe that would have kept him loyal to Ned, at least for a little while. Either way, it'd keep Ned alive, and for now, and his daughter safe. Instead, Ned turns him down and asks him to buy the city watch. And that's really it. That's the end of it. That was the final mistake. Turning down Littlefinger, turning down Renly before that. He's as good as dead the moment Littlefinger leaves the room. Littlefinger sees no opportunity with Ned, so now he moves on to his next opportunity because that's what Littlefinger does. And we can discuss him in another video at another time. But which, this just leads us to Ned getting royally outplayed in the throne room. Cersei tears up Robert's last words. The City Watch reveal that they serve Cersei, and Littlefinger reveals his loyalties are not to Ned. Now if we move on to episode 8 and 9, because Ned spends all of episode 8 in the dungeons and the beginning of episode 9 in the dungeons beneath the Red Keep with only Varys coming to visit. Ultimately, all he's done is give Ned a drink and question his decision making and criticize his misplaced mercy. And I could dive into this in another video, but this is one area that the show and the books are not really the same. Ned has visions and dreams in the books that detail much more of prior events, or at least the way he sees them, but the show doesn't give us any of that, so I'm not going to talk about it. Varys confesses a bit of his past to Ned and ultimately tries to convince Ned to proclaim Joffrey king, make peace, tell Rob to stop his march against the Lannisters, and ask mercy from Cersei, and ultimately take the Black and join the Night's Watch. Ned is reluctant to do this because he's well prepared to die. Then Varys reminds him of his daughters and I think that really changes his decision to confess to treason. There's a moment I want to remind everyone of in, in, in this moment. Varys gets very frustrated when Ned states that Stannis is the rightful heir. Ned asks if Varys wants him to serve Cersei and Varys yells, I want you to serve the realm because the honorable thing in this situation does not serve the realm. At least not honorable in by Ned's definition, and if only Ned could have been convinced of this before, things probably would have been different and better for most of our characters that remain beyond Season 1. But now we're at the end. Ned is brought before the Sept of Baylor to confess his treason, and this is done a little different in the books, but Ned sees Arya on the statue of Baylor, Baylor and when he walks past Yorn, he yells Baylor to him. Ned confesses his treason after proclaiming Joffrey the true king. Ned holds up his end of the bargain, and Cersei has asked Joffrey to send him to the wall, and Joffrey promised mercy to Sansa. 
but instead... Bring me his head! And that's that. Sansa watches on, and Arya is taken under the protection of Yorn. Now to me, this was very much a surprise. Rewatching Game of Thrones and really just focusing on each individual character, I've grown familiar with screen time per character and there's no doubt, Ned is the main protagonist of season one and book one, the Game, the Game of Thrones. Although Daenerys feels independent of everything in Westeros, uh, so she's kind of got her own protagonist feel to her as well, but season one, it's Ned's story for the most part. But my focus of this video was strictly on Ned and I've shared some thoughts along the way. I disagree with much of his decisions. I don't think honor got him killed. I think a sprinkle of mercy, a dash of bad luck, mixed with mostly poor strategy killed him or at least put him at the mercy of a child king born of incest. I think never demanding the claims Lysa made being validated by speaking directly to Lysa is very questionable. Showing his hand at every turn to his enemies or people he distrusts while keeping Robert in the dark made little sense. His interactions with Cersei proved to be more honest and transparent than any conversation he had with his best friend Robert. So I conclude, Ned is a great character and incredibly flawed and interesting and foolish at times. And I can't say honestly that it was honor that got him killed. Some people blame Sansa and Catelyn whether it be their actions in the shows or the books, but he had opportunities to get out after that and instead made his situation worse. Seriously, when Robert died, what kept him in King's Landing? Was it to honor his duty? Okay, I'll give you that one, but honorable or not, it was foolish. I started this video asking if honor equates to good or right. I know a lot of people admit that Ned let honor get him killed, and he sacrificed himself to be honorable. Others say he wasn't honorable, he was just stupid. I think those two things can both be right. And you could summarize that the code to be honorable is stupid, that honor itself is stupid. Because honor is not always good, and it's not always right. It's a value system, and if you look around our world, an inflexible value system, that often even contradicts itself, can lead to unfortunate outcomes. Anyway, that's it from me, you guys.